Hello, welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. Okay, so it's another episode this week. I hope everyone's enjoying all the previous episodes this, uh, this week. On this episode, I am very pleased to be talking with Paul Halpern. Uh, Paul is a professor of physics at St. Joseph's University. He has a bachelor's, master's, and PhD all in, in physics. He was the recipient of 2002 Guggenheim Fellowship and 1996 Fulbright Scholarship. He's the author of numerous books, including the most recent, The Allure of the Multiverse, Extra Dimensions, Other Worlds, and Parallel Universes. And that's what we talk about in this conversation. I haven't had a lot of uh, conversations on, on the podcast about uh, physics and theoretical physics. Um, I, I greatly enjoy theoretical physics, um, tremendously so actually. And I've read, you know, as much as I can understand, uh, plenty of kind of popular science books on it. Um, but uh, when I was putting this together, I realized I haven't had that many episodes on theoretical physics. So, um, I think, uh, Paul's book is fantastic. at kind of just really explaining it to the layman, uh, that doesn't know all the math behind it. Like myself, about the multiverse and all these big ideas. And so it was, it was such a treat and such a joy to, to kind of get him on and to hear him explain it. So we discuss uh, many things in the book. Uh, we talk about the cosmological multiverse, many worlds interpretation. Um, we talk about the impact of Newton, Maxwell, Einstein for general relativity. We talk about gravitational waves, quantum mechanics. We talk about different dimensions, dark matter, dark energy, string theory. Uh, the multiverse in popular culture, which is movies and shows and things like that, and uh, many, many other topics. It was, uh, it, this conversation was so much fun. It was just such a fun conversation to have. Um, he's, he's a great science communicator. And it's really interesting to think about all of these things about our, our, our universe, about our world, and seeing what are the things that we're continuing to to learn and continuing to understand about uh you know not just our planet but our solar system and our universe and and uh it's it's i think it's i think it's just always something to learn in in these spaces and so paul's a a great person to to uh to follow and to to uh to read his book so it's uh it's just, again just such a treat as always you can find this conversation and all the conversations at converging dialogues at substack.com i'm also on youtube so please subscribe, follow, share widely, tell your friends, feel free to leave a comment, uh, review. And of course you can always contribute, always trying to make the podcast better. And, uh, now I bring you Paul Alpert. I am here with Paul Halpern. Uh, Paul, thanks so much for, uh, coming on the podcast. I, uh, great looking forward to, uh, to talking with you. Thank you, Xavier, for inviting me. I look no. forward to our conversation too. Of course, of course. You have a, a, a wonderful book out. It's called The Allure of the Multiverse, uh, Extra Dimensions, Other Worlds, and Parallel Universes. And uh, it's, uh, it's fabulous. It's, it's fabulous for, for people like myself that, that didn't get a degree in, in uh, physics. So I can understand, you know, a little bit of this stuff a little bit more. Uh, and, and definitely for, for, for many uh, readers as well that don't. Um, so it's, it's great. And so we'll get all into it. And, uh, before we do, uh, why don't you tell listeners, um, just who you are professionally, academically, and, uh, what you, what you're currently, um, uh, thinking about. I'm a professor of physics at St. Joseph's university in Philadelphia. My background is that I have a PhD in theoretical physics from Stony Brook, and I've been teaching for a number of years and I'm interested in not just physics, but also cultural aspects of physics, connection between physics and other subjects. And that's what I've explored in my research. Uh, some of my research is in general relativity, uh, more equations, but then some other aspects of my research include history of physics and cultural connection to physics. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's interesting. As I was reading the book, I, I feel like, I, is, it, is this a... A common thing, I guess. I, when I read kind of popular science books with uh, with physics, it's always a kind of uh, history lesson smuggled in there, right? Because I felt it's so it's always interesting because I say, like, okay, we talk about Newton, and, and I think you talk about uh, Maxwell. You talk about you talk about all these, you know, obviously Einstein. You talk about all these, and it's kind of the history of 
well, this person did this. And then the person that came after them, you know, fixed it. And then they did this. And then this person did this. And it feels a lot like that. Is that kind of a, kind of a standard way of, of telling that story of physics? You, you got to know what the last guy did or last guy or gal did uh, before you talk about the new guy that, that uh, did his thing? Or is that, is that usually kind of how it works? Yeah, I, I tend to put pack a lot of history into my books, mm -hmm. uh, all of my books, but especially my more recent books. I've had a lot about different figures in science and their quirks and some of their preferences and, and aspects of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I find that the public is, is fascinated by this idea that scientists are human too, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. have different things going on in their lives while they're trying to think about you know, their theories. And they might have preferences based upon their own backgrounds, you know, as to which theory they would prefer. Mm. For example, Einstein grew up in the 19th century and was exposed to a lot of ideas about mysticism and, uh, and the occult as being anti-scientific. And for example, uh, he learned about uh, people who believed in higher dimensions as being mystics. And supporters of the occult. So uh, for a long time, he was very much opposed to the idea of higher dimensions because he saw it as something that was non-scientific. Mm -hmm. Similarly, he saw the idea of long-range interactions uh, without some kind of intermediary as being similar to telepathy. Mm -hmm. So this, this uh, disdain he had for uh, pseudoscience and mystic aspects of the world uh, carried out to his, his science where he was, you know, very much opposed to things involving what he called spooky interactions at a distance, which were long distance interactions without any connections. And also he was initially opposed to the idea of the fourth dimension, which turned mm. out to be essential to his research. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's, it is interesting. I like that, that, that kind of way of, of kind of humanizing scientists. I mean, they scientists are usually a, a, a pretty rare bunch. I mean, it, is, it takes a lot of brain power to, to think about the world in that way. And it's, that's not something you just kind of bump into every day. And, and even if that's the case, there's still people like you and I and, and, uh, and many other, other folks. So that's, that's always a good thing. So for, for this book, I mean, I know this isn't your first book, but for this one, uh, it's about the, the multiverse. So obviously, I, I think you mentioned it in the last chapter. There's a lot of fascination in in uh, in fiction and television shows and movies and popular media about the multiverse, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And um, and I, I, I mean, it, just as a side note, I mean, I don't know how uh, I, I always kind of take it as you know fiction and or science fiction. I, I don't take it as legitimate um, in terms of how it's portrayed, but. It is interesting that there is this kind of um, fascination because I think kind of comes up with a multiverse idea is uh, are there other copies of us out there? Are there other, are we in a simulation or, you know, can we go backwards in time or forwards in time? There's all of these, I think, things wrapped up in it. But I guess if you were to kind of, to you know, encapsulate it here. What, what, what is it that is captivating and capturing the imagination of people and not just people, scientists as well, uh, with this multiverse notion, right? Where, why is this you, the, basically the story of the book is that the multiverse idea has been around for a while, right? But it's really kind of on steroids right now, right? <laughs> because, you know, it's in, it's in our, our media. But why, why do we, why are we interested with this? Or is it just one of those things where it's like, you know what, you know, the, this has to be the way it is, or there's, this is the only plausible likelihood. And now we just have to figure out how we can, you know, kind of test it and prove it. Why the fascination with, with the multiverse? Well, I think there are two types of fascination mm. that are very different. Um, the public is fascinated by the idea of what if mm. roads not taken in their own their own lives. And uh, for example, if somebody has a choice of jobs in different cities, they might say, hey, you know, I took the job in Boston, but what if I took the job in LA instead? What would my life be like now? You know, who would I have met in my life? Maybe I would have a different circle of friends. Right. You know, what would happen if I met a different partner? Uh, what would that be like? Uh, so people think 
in terms of their jobs, in terms of their relationships. They think of all the other possibilities. And then especially when something tragic happens, they might go back and say, well, what could I have done different? Mm. You know, if there was some way of controlling it, maybe there was no way of controlling it. Um, and a lot of films play upon that idea that if you just made or missed a train, you know, it's a film sliding doors mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. the protagonist in one case just makes a train and in another case just misses the doors of the train, mm. uh, hence the title of the film. And it goes through all the different ways her life, life would be different and or the same. So there's some similarities and some differences if she had missed a train versus not missed a train. And that's very interesting to see how it ends up. And in some cases, uh, something that might seem beneficial uh, might turn out to be detrimental. Mm -hmm. For example, you make a train and that happens to be a train that gets into an accident. You might say, hey, wait a minute. What if I had missed the train? That would have been really great. Mm -hmm. But at the time when you make a train, you might say, oh, well, I feel really lucky. Mm -hmm. So luck sometimes is relative and you don't know if you're lucky or not until things play out. So these are all things that are played with in science fiction, explored, you know, the idea of what would happen if you could access these other universes. And then in, in modern films, there's this idea of alternative versions of the same character. Like, for example, what if there was another Spider-Man who uh, evolved differently in a different uh, setting, a different mm -hmm. type of neighborhood, a different location, and so forth. Uh, and that, and Spider into the Spider-Verse, mm -hmm. across the Spider-Verse, these films play upon the idea that, okay, there's another Spider-Man, Miles, uh, who's not Peter Parker and has a very different life story, but is also legitimately Spider-Man. And then there are Spider-Man coming from other universes mm -hmm. and you know having different aspects of their lives. And this is fascinating to the public uh, in these films, alternative versions of superheroes, alternative versions of villains. Now for science, on the other hand, uh, scientists don't really look at human lives the same way they don't look at alternatives to people's lives it's more like they look at ways to try to resolve certain uh, theories mm. uh, conundrums and trying to smooth out certain aspects of theories and a lot of theories these days have a lot of different solutions so you have the same theory and you have all these possibilities but the world might only have one possibility that we observe. So the question is, what narrows down all these options into one option? Is it because we take an observation? Is it because we are here? There are all these theories that involve multiple universes or multiple realities where there's some kind of filter and the filter filters out all of them except for one possibility. And that leads to the reality that we see today. And those are scientific ideas of the multiverse, including the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. which involves ways of uh, allowing for multiple possibilities of some kind of measurement. And instead of the measurer uh, narrowing down the options by taking the measurement, which is the old way of thinking of quantum mechanics, instead, the universe has many branches and the measurer, him or herself, uh, splits, their consciousness splits into many possibilities. And one possibility sees one value of the measurement, another possibility sees another value of the measurement. Hmm. And then there's also in cosmology, the idea that the universe was seeded and formed our Big Bang, but there might have been other bubbles out there that similarly expanded that we don't see. And you know, the universe, rather than being a single origin universe, is a multiverse of all these bubble universes, most of them ending up uh, fizzling out, but ours being the successful one that produces planets and life as we know it. Mm. 
Yeah, I think it's a <clears throat> a hard thing for a lot of people to understand the idea of another universe, which is strange because <clears throat> if you if you go kind of inside out, right? You have planet Earth, you have eight planets in our solar system, you have our uh, Milky Way, the galaxy, um, and you know, in our universe, we have many galaxies and we have many planets and exoplanets, uh, many systems. Um, and, and to think that there's, you know, the, with being it's so vast, we're still getting pictures from all over the universe to think that there's another universe or other universes with other galaxies, other systems, other planets is, is almost, it, it almost sounds kind of absurd to try and even think about how that's possible. But I guess in theory, it sort of could, could be. I mean, how, 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 do, <laughs> how does that, I guess the, the one question I have on this is there's a lot of, I mean, we'll talk about string theory probably at, at, at some point here, but how, how do we prove like the multiverse idea? Like how, how it's been difficult to have like evidence for that, I, I, I'm assuming here, but I mean, how do we prove it? And why is that important to prove? Because it's, you know, the theory can only take you so far, right? Like there's only so much, right? And at a certain point, you someone's got to be a genius and has got to get on that big chalkboard somewhere in, in a in a <laughs> in a lab or in a in an institution, uh, academic institution, doing all the long equations that fill up a whole board or whatever. I guess they're on computers now, maybe. But um, yeah, how how do we how do we actually know that, or or maybe could have some concrete evidence to prove? Now, there's not just this universe, but there's multiple universes out there. Well, the cosmological multiverse is one of many types of multiverses. So that's distinct from the many worlds interpretation. Mm. But to prove the cosmological multiverse, you need to go back in time to the origins of our universe when our universe, as the observable universe, was very small and uh, started out according to a theory called Eternal inflation uh, as a kind of a seed, which is uh, triggered by an energy field. So it's a little bit uh, abstract, but in quantum physics, energy fields can be produced from the vacuum. The vacuum is something which is as close to nothingness as we can imagine, mm. but it's still not absolutely nothing because even in empty space, all of these energy fields and particles pop in and out of existence because Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says mm. that there can never be absolute nothing, that if you look at a small interval of time, it's likely that something will pop out of nothingness, mm. even for a fleeting moment, and go back into the void. Mm. I kind of think about it as something like dolphins pop popping out of the sea, and they have a certain amount of time to be in the air, but then they go back into the sea. Mm. Uh, so that's this idea of, of a quantum vacuum, which is producing these energy fields. And as Andre Linde and others showed, if the energy field has just the right properties, it triggers a rapid expansion in Einstein's general theory of relativity, a rapid expansion of space. So an exponential expansion. And that low spec part of space blows up tremendously. Now, if there are other triggers out there, other regions that are triggered, which would seem to be likely given how easy it is for the energy field to trigger an expansion. There might be other regions where expansion is triggered too. Then you have all of these balloons, balloon-like universes blowing up, and they are blowing up all over the place in some kind of you know, endless uh, region. And once they start blowing up, um, they become so far away from each other mm. um, very, very rapidly that there's no way of direct interaction. Mm. But it is possible that very early on, these bubble universes collided with each other and left a mark on each other. And our universe has a radiation field in the background called the cosmic microwave background radiation which was once very hot, but now is kind of a very uh, low temperature hiss. 
that can be detected and mapped out. And it's possible that there are scars in that hiss of collisions with other bubble universes very early on. Mm. So we can't really detect these universes today because everything is blown up, everything is so far away from each other. But it's possible that there were some scars or imprints on our universe's cosmic microwave background that could be detected. So research teams are trying to find ways of detecting these subtle signals and in a way that's definitive evidence of collisions with other bubble universes. Hmm. That's, that's very fascinating. I I I I want to be the I want to be the researcher that finds finds that out the first time. <laughs> that should be very very spectacular. Certainly, a Nobel Prize. Oh, I mean, I mean, yeah, of course. But even more than that, just just I mean the the idea of knowing of sort. Um, so let's. You're saying that we need time, right? And I think this might be a, a good place to to talk about uh, Einstein. Of course, you mentioned in the book Newton. And the laws of motion, you, you talk about Maxwell and electromagnetism and speed of light. So you, you can kind of reference those, I guess, if you want to, to, to build up to it. But uh, kind of give us the, the overview. I mean, some people will know this, you know, from, from uh, if they have high school or college courses or whatever. But to try to explain as, as best you can. I mean, I, I still find, I mean, I'm, I'm no physicist, but my very poor understanding of General relativity. I, I've tried to explain it to, to people, and it's always it's, it's very it's simple and, and complicated at the same time. So maybe just tell us about Einstein's general relativity, and and then we can talk about some of what you mentioned earlier, these kind of fourth and fifth dimensions, and some of the players there. But if you want to bring up Newton and Maxwell, that's fine. But tell us about what was so important about Einstein's general relativity and how it helps us to understand space, time, uh, and how that could help us understand. Uh, understanding of, you know, multiple universes. Well, Newton, Maxwell, and Einstein are all key to this story of our uh, efforts to understand this phenomenon called gravitation, gravity. And of course, Newton famously uh, saw an apple falling from a tree, uh, according to contemporary reports, <laughs> and that inspired him to think, hey, the apple's motion and attraction kind of resembles something like the moon or the Earth going around the sun, maybe there's a universal attraction between all massive objects. Um, so that was the first idea of gravitation, the Newtonian idea, which occurs over a long distance. So the Earth and the sun are very, very far away, and uh, Newton speculated that there was some kind of invisible thread linking the Earth and the sun and the Earth and the moon, causing this gravitational attraction. But the problem with the invisible thread idea is that what happens if this thread suddenly snaps? What happens if the sun disappears? Well, Earth would suddenly uh, start going in a straight line, according to Newton, that it would have no force on it, just instantly start going in a straight line. Well, that takes place, uh, that would take place instantly, but light and other signals take time to travel. And as Maxwell theorized, and as other people showed, such as um, Albert Michelson uh, showed, light has a finite speed, mm. and uh, the speed of light um, cannot be exceeded. And therefore, we would not expect that gravitation would happen instantly. We would expect that it happens as a ripple through space, just as light travels as a ripple through space. So the question. Einstein had is what ripples, what travels through space to get to Earth that would signal the gravitation of the sun. And um, that he soon realized is a ripple in the fabric of space itself. So, uh, and more particularly space time, which he showed in his theories that um, space and time are united in a single four dimensional entity which um, Minkowski came up with the four-dimensional idea, but Einstein incorporated that into his theories. And then later showed that this four-dimensional canvas can be distorted through the presence of mass, just like if you had a trampoline and an elephant were to jump onto the trampoline, the trampoline would be greatly distorted. And that would affect 
anything that was on the trampoline. For example, if you had some kind of beach ball and we're trying to push it along the trampoline, it would start traveling in a, a curved path rather than in a straight line path. So massive objects distort space time. And in response, objects traveling through that space time move in a curved path. And that's uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity. And so space time is not a passive object. It's an active player in the dynamics of the universe. It can stretch, it can shrink, it can distort in various ways, it can be twisted up, so um, it can create waves, as scientists show in LIGO and other gravitational wave detection uh, systems, uh, that waves travel through space-time. Uh, for example, if two black holes collide, they create waves in space-time. So this is this thing out there, uh, space-time, which is very active and uh, can be distorted, and that creates wells that um, trap uh, planets and other objects into elliptical orbits. And that's Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity in a nutshell. So <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I guess it's been a little bit longer now, but we actually were able to, uh, what was it, uh, observe or or or... Yeah, I guess observe gravitational waves, right? This was the big find. And this is my understanding was basically, I mean, we're still doing Einstein's homework, you know, 120 years later, right? <laughs> this is something that he was, I think, had a paper in 1907 or 1905 or something like that. And what was the significance based on everything you just said about this dynamicism? What was the significance of actually observing gravitational waves? Well, Going back to the humanness of scientists, Einstein went back and forth on the idea of whether or not gravitational waves are real. Um, after he developed his general theory of relativity in 1915, he proposed um, the idea that there might be these gravitational waves. But then, um, then around 20 years later, he, uh, working with a scientist named Nathan Rosen, um, did some calculations, and the calculations turned out to show initially that there weren't any gravitational waves. So Einstein was about to publish a paper, and he submitted it to a prestigious journal, Physical Review, and the conclusion was gravitational waves don't exist, and a paper was rejected. And Einstein was absolutely incensed. How can a journal send my paper to a reviewer? I'm, you know, he thought, I'm Einstein, I publish a lot, but for anyone, why send it to a reviewer? Don't you trust the calculations? Well, the reviewer was somebody named H.P. Robertson, who was an expert on general relativity at Princeton. And the reviewer found out that there was a mistake in Einstein's calculations. So he rejected the paper, and then he somehow behind the scenes informed Einstein and Rosen about the mistake. They fixed the mistake, and rather than sending it back to the same journal, they sent it to a different journal, the Journal of the Franklin Institute, mm. where it was published. And that conclusion was the exact opposite, that gravitational waves do exist. And uh, so Einstein corrected the mistake and it predict predicted that there were gravitational waves. Now, but not until recent years were these gravitational waves detected through black hole collisions through a very, very sensitive instrument, uh, set of instruments called LIGO. One of them is in uh, Washington State, the other is in Louisiana, and they use uh, masses moving very, very slightly, very, very, very delicately, and um, the masses detect these waves, only very strong waves from, for example, black hole collisions or black holes colliding with neutron stars, and it's enough to jostle these masses a tiniest fraction of the size of, of an atomic particle. So we're talking about even smaller than a proton mm. are, are these, these um, jostling of the, these masses. But the way you detect it is you take 
a beam of light, laser beam, and you um, hit it from various directions onto this mass, and then you measure the, uh, the, the time it takes for, for these to go back and forth many, many times. So the light is bouncing back and forth on this mass and mirrors, and you have this whole system where the light keeps bouncing back and forth and going in different directions, and then it reunites with itself after being split into two parts. And then if um, you, you don't have any distortion uh, due to mass moving, uh, you have one result, which is the light lines up with itself. And if um, you do have distortion, then the light does not line up with itself. And you can measure this very subtle difference. And that leads to detection of gravitational waves. And many more uh, signals have been detected since the original one. It's become almost a gravitational wave factory <laughs> of detecting these signals. So <clears throat> what is it about, I mean, so what are the, the waves, right? Is it, is it just a kind of uh, a tangible thing of, of seeing kind of gravity, like there's these kind of ripples of, of gravity through, through space time? Or what is it specifically that we're, we're seeing with gravitational waves? Is it just, is it pointing to, like you're saying, another uh, mass colliding? Like what is the actual tangibility of, of uh, gravitational waves? Well, imagine you have a buoy in, in the ocean and then this big ship goes by and the buoy starts jostling back and forth and you think, even if you don't see the ship, you think, oh, something must have gone by to uh, disturb it. Mm. And, uh, and then similarly, um, space-time can become distorted due to some catastrophic, catastrophic event. Mm. And that spreads from the site of the catastrophe. These waves spread out in all directions. Mm. And they hit the Earth. And normally, we don't see it because the Earth is, is massive. We don't see, you know, the Earth rippling. It's not like the tides from the moon, mm -hmm. which is, you know, uh, some more tangible thing where the ocean rises and falls, mm -hmm. which is more of a sign of gravity. But these waves from space uh, are very subtle, so they don't really affect us, except if you can set up a mass that's so sensitive to any kind of gravitational distortion that it will move back and forth even from the tiniest ripple, and that's what uh, the detectors have, these masses that are ultra-sensitive to distortion mm. and move back and forth, and then light signals that can detect even these subtle distortions. Mm. This is so interesting. So <clears throat> about the dimensions, you, you talked about in, in, in the chapter about, about Einstein, about uh, Klein, who, who came up with these ideas of higher dimensions, uh, and uh, Kaluza as well, and um, we, we we eventually, as you mentioned, Einstein came to 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 find this as essential. So we have a, a, at the time, at the very least, you know, four dimensions, right? And, and space time being one of them. How did this become really important? And and then how did this kind of? I mean, there were other things going on, but as you as you again, as you know the story. You start mentioning all the all the big uh, heavy hitters. You, know, you start mentioning Niels Bohr and von Neumann and Heisenberg and Schrodinger and Bonn. Bon, about they start pushing into the quantum realm. So how do we get what what's bridge that gap for us? I guess of understanding a little bit about dimensions. Okay, there's at least four, but you know, trying to get that grand unified theory. But we we get to this idea of going kind of the opposite way instead of the kind of bigger you know, systems kind of thing. We go to the smallest possible things we can't even see in the quantum realm. How, how are dimensions kind of a, a player here? And how do, how do we get from general relativity to kind of quantum mechanics? Well, the story of dimensions goes back to the ancient world. Uh, and we have um, people from ancient Greece speculating on whether or not there might be something beyond the standard dimensions of length, width, and height. And Plato came up with his cave allegory to suggest the idea that if we lived in a two-dimensional world, um, that we would, might see shadows of three-dimensional figures. And he imagined uh, people trapped in a cave 
prisoners who uh, can only look at a wall and they see the shadows of people walking by and they think that's real. And Plato never said this, but the implication is maybe three-dimensional reality is really a shadow of a higher dimensional reality. And uh, this came to the fore in the 19th century when mathematicians started getting very experimental and calculating the idea of manifolds. A manifold is just a fancy word for something like a sheet in higher dimensions. You know, a sheet or a cube or a sphere extended into higher dimensions and see what happened. So people like Gauss and Riemann in the 19th century were trying to extend things mathematically into higher dimensions and then um, came up with all these theories of multiple dimensions, mathematics. And then you have the science fiction writers uh, kicking in and saying, hey, wait a minute, what if these were real? And you have Ed Ed Edwin Abbott's Flatland mm, talking mm -hmm. about creatures living in a, a flat plane and speculating about um, uh, or eventually encountering uh, someone from a three-dimensional realm of sphere who enters your space and then speculating about even higher dimensions beyond that. So all this was talked about in the late 19th century when Einstein was a kid. And then Einstein developed his special theory of relativity in um, 1905, which talks about how space and time are each separately distorted when you travel close to the speed of light. So, for example, if you had a spaceship traveling close to the speed of light, its length would shrink in the direction of the motion, but its clocks would tick more slowly in, 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 as it travels closer and closer to the speed of light. Um, so Einstein talked about that. He did not try to unite space and time, but then one of his former professors, Hermann Minkowski, who was a, um, a German um, or particularly East Prussian um, mathematician, came up with this idea of uniting space and time into a single entity called space-time. So he said that space and time are hereby abolished as separate things, and instead we have this revolutionary concept of space-time that combines all of space and time into four dimensions, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. And that was very interesting. And Einstein took a few years to accept that because he thought, well, this is making things too abstract, too mathematical. This is really, really weird. But then Einstein's friends and colleagues convinced him that that was a good way of expressing special relativity because then he could talk about length contraction mm -hmm. and time dilation as being two sides of the same coin. The length shrinks and the time stretches out as a way of uh, space giving something to time uh, in a kind of rotation in higher dimensional uh, space time. Uh, so anyway, um, so Einstein accepted the four dimensions and then used it for general relativity and said that you have this four dimensional manifold, this four dimensional object that's distorted in general relativity. And then a couple years later, this fellow, uh, Calusa came along and said, hey, wait a minute, maybe you can add electricity and magnetism to the theory, not just gravitation, by making space for it by adding a fifth dimension. And uh, Calusa and then later Klein speculated about the idea of a fifth dimension that was undetectable, that you can't really detect. And quantum mechanics comes in because um, Klein used the idea of quantizing charge as a way to justify mm. this fifth dimension. And later, Einstein uh, explored his own five-dimensional models. Mm. Now, speaking of quantum physics, there there's an abstract kind of dimension called Hilbert space, mm -hmm. which can be unlimited, which reflects all the possibilities that a particle can have before, uh, in, in the standard version of quantum mechanics, before you take a measurement particle might be in, you know, an endless uh, number of, of uh, dimensions of Hilbert space, and each of them reflects a different possibility for that particle. Um, so there are abstract dimensions in quantum
quantum mechanics too, which are different from these spatial dimensions. Is <clears throat> is some of the 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 challenge here? I think for for common folks is we can't see the higher dimensions, so it's hard to believe sometimes, right? Again, unless you're super smart <laughs> and you know you can do the math for physics. I always like I always find and this is where maybe there's you know there's a there's pros and cons to it, but one of the pros I think for for popular media is it, it kind of sort of helps visualize whether it's a documentary on on you know the universe or things like that but um I always think of the the film Interstellar right where they're explaining how they get to the other you know they get to the wormhole and they get to the other um the other galaxy or whatever and they're you know they go on the planet and the one guy stays back and it's been like 24 years, right? He's aged and they're still the same. And it's like, well, how does that work? How, do, how, how did, and, you know, we were only down there for an hour and a half and, you know, it's like 24 years over here. And it's this kind of illustration, if you will, of, well, no, that's space time. That's how it works, right? And again, it's a story, but the idea of, is it, is it hard to kind of, or maybe, or maybe even initially for scientists to say, well, give me, give me the, give me the data. Give me the, give me the proofs. Give me the equations. Let me see. And then until you see, but even then, right? Like it's, it's hard to kind of initially get down with a lot of these things. Like how are, I mean, I know again, string theory says there could be 10 or 11 or 12 dimensions. That's just a hard thing maybe for finite brains to really get of like, well, I'm in four dimensional space. At least I can sort of experience that if you will. I can't really experience anything past that. Is that is that what kind of makes and you can do the same with the quantum realm. It's like we can't even see this stuff. Like is that what kind of makes it somewhat hard theoretically or abstractly and then certainly uh trying to prove it's just cuz there's this way where we can't see or experience it. Is that, is that a difficult part of some of this or no? Well, this question was is very profound and was much talked about in the late 19th century. And there's a mathematician, Charles Hinton, who uh, is also known as the inventor of the baseball gun. A little bit of trivia, he came up with the automatic baseball pitching uh, gun. But also, um, he developed this idea of the tesseract, which mm. was a way of trying to visualize mm. the fourth dimension. So he wrote book, all these books with pictures of projections or shadows of four-dimensional objects and said, you just have to use your imagination to try to wrap your mind around this idea of a higher spatial dimension. Um, so, for example, if you take a hypercube, which is a four-dimensional cube, mm -hmm. you can draw it uh, on a piece of paper by imagining taking some light and finding a shadow of it on the piece of paper and what the shadow would look like. So that's one way of visualizing a higher spatial dimension. And visualizing a time dimension uh, just uh, is, involves looking at something and how it evolves over time mm -hmm. and kind of connecting all those pictures together. Uh, for example, if you took a, a video of a balloon blowing up and then um, each frame of the video has a balloon at different sizes, mm -hmm. Um, so you have balloon, you know, it's small, gets bigger, 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 reaches the maximum size, and then you deflate it mm. and it starts shrinking again. If you, if you could take that uh, footage and look at all the shots, you know, let's say you were editing it um, in some kind of uh, film software, video software, you could see all the shots at once, all the sizes, mm -hmm. and that would be a way of understanding the fourth dimension of time because you would see all moments at once mm. all the different stages uh, and if you could do that for a human life you might see uh you know newborn baby and then you know, a toddler a child adult and then an older person you know s see all these frames in their life and connect them together in something that um, george gamov and others call the world line George Gamow, who is a physicist, wrote a, his biography was autobiography was My World Line mm. because he imagined connecting all these things in the fourth dimension. Mm. So, um, so that's a way of visualizing uh, 
fourth dimension in space, a fourth dimension in time. And then um, you need some experimental filmmakers to help <laughs> try to understand uh, even higher dimensions using animation and so forth. Mm -hmm. I have a friend, uh, Peter Rose, who's uh, a filmmaker, uh, retired from the uh, University of the Arts, and he does these wonderful things with what he calls uh, sixth dimension, which is he combines um, uh, two different, uh, two diff different uh, uh, three-dimensional or uh, imagery, which can be observed through, um, uh, you know, these these three D glasses, or in his case, something called Google Glass, which uh, which you can picture three D thing. Mm -hmm. But then he t he takes these things and combines them for different moments of time, and creates this what he calls a six dimensional tapestry. Mm -hmm the scene and it's really fascinating stuff mm. to watch it watch this um, these these so-called six dimensional imagery mm. and video yeah that's that's super super clever i think that's i think that's interesting it helps us to understand these things but it also gives you this kind of uh strange thing that there's so much of of reality that's beyond our experience that's why i always kind of hate those arguments about well if it's real if it's in reality it's like well much of reality is is way past our sensorium uh which is also kind of uh haunting in another way it's really really exciting and fascinating in another way but it's also kind of very very haunting us as well um so so you mentioned also these these two i want to get to the multiple worlds interpretation uh in a sec but you talk about Everett and, and Meisner, and they, they work together on, on wave functions and quantum mechanics. Uh, talk about some of their work and what they did together and, um, and, and how we kind of get to this many worlds idea. Well, um, Hugh Everett III and Charles Misner um, were both two students of, of John Wheeler in the 1950s. Uh, Charles Misner sadly uh, died Early, early last year. Hmm. Um, so, but I, I had the pleasure of meeting him several times, oh, nice. interviewing him. And uh, I never met Hugh Everett. He, he passed away a long time ago. Uh, he was pretty young. Hmm. And they were friends in, at uh, Princeton in the graduate college. And Hugh Everett started off not really planning to do physics. He planned to do something called game theory hmm. with. Um, you know, associates of John von Neumann and others, um, not von Neumann himself, but uh, other people. But then uh, he got roped into uh, physics from a fascination with it. And Misner and, and Everett went to one of the last lectures of Albert Einstein. Mm. And Albert Einstein at the lecture asked the question, um, if in quantum physics, a human being causes the collapse of the quantum state into one of many possibilities, which is the standard Niels Bohr interpretation of quantum mechanics as, ex as further explained by John von Neumann, this idea that somehow when you look at something or measure something, it collapses the state into one possibility. Well, Einstein asked the question, well, what about a mouse? If a mouse looks at something, why can't it collapse the state? You know, why human? And he was trying to point out the absurdity of the whole situation, similar to Schrodinger's uh, cat thought experiment, where Schrodinger was trying to point out the absurdity of quantum mechanics by imagining that opening a box could affect whether or not uh, a cat that's in a mixed state of being alive and dead collapses into living or dead. So there, these ideas were kind of similar. One was a mouse, and one was a cat. Mm. Um, make a great cartoon mm -hmm. putting them together. Mm -hmm. But um, but anyway, um, Everett came out of this uh, seminar and thought, well, there must be a better way to explain quantum mechanics rather than including human observation as one of the ingredients. Because after all, people have atoms too and are part of nature too. Why should humans be special? So, uh, and, and it turns out at the same time, their mentor, John Wheeler, was trying to come up with a, a quantum state of the universe and a way for that quantum state to collapse down into the classical universe. But it would be hard to imagine a being outside of the universe, a 
observing the universe and causing this. So uh, John Wheeler started to conclude that it must be being within the universe or it must be some aspect of the universe. And Everett said, well, what if there was no collapse at all? What if a person observing a quantum system uh, evolved along with that quantum system? So if that quantum system had multiple possibilities for a measurement, let's say an electron could be um, you know, one centimeter to the left of some target or one centimeter to the right of some target, and those were the two possibilities, instead of when taking a measurement, the quantum state collapses down into one of those options, you have human observers branching into those two possibilities. So one person comes out of the measurement saying, oh, that electron was one centimeter to the left of the target. And the other um, would say, oh, it's one centimeter to the right of the target. And both of them would be equally convinced that their conclusion was correct. Mm. And they'd have no way of interacting with each other. Mm. Um, so Wheeler thought that was an interesting idea. He tried to convince Niels Bohr to accept it. Niels Bohr would have nothing of it. He was very conservative. Mm in that sense that he didn't want to abandon his own ideas. And then finally, um, Wheeler got um, the paper submitted to a, a journal and uh, the editor was a physicist named Bryce DeWitt. And Bryce DeWitt immediately said, hey, wait a minute, this is ridiculous. We don't feel our, our states, our mental states dividing into two possibilities. We don't feel that at all. And he wrote back to Wheeler. Wheeler forwarded a message to Everett. And Everett wrote back and said, hey, wait a minute. Do we feel the Earth rotating? And does that mean that the Earth doesn't rotate because we just don't feel yeah. it? You know, things can happen that we just don't experience. Mm -hmm. So this branching could just be something we just never experienced, but it could still be valid. Mm -hmm. So DeWitt responded, touche, you're absolutely right. And then became the leading advocate of the theory, which he dubbed the many universes model of quantum mechanics, which became the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and uh, became popular from that point on. Hmm. So you also mentioned with the, the many worlds interpretation, the, the Born rule, right? And then, then why there was a necessity for, for good measurement here. Um, so, so maybe here I, you can fit it somewhere else if you want to, but you, you mentioned earlier in the beginning, there was the, there's a many worlds interpretation and then the cosmological interpretation or whatever. There's these two, maybe, maybe talk about these kind of two interpretations of, of, uh, of many worlds or universes. Yeah. Well, the Born rule is this idea that you can calculate the probability of a quantum event happening and, uh, very simple calculation done all the time in quantum mechanics. So if you wanted to calculate the probability of getting an electron in a certain location, you could, you could do that. And then the way that typically the way that that's verified is you take multiple measurements. Mm. So let's say you take thousands of measurements of the same system and you map out where the electrons end up and you get a distribution. And that distribution matches up you know, precisely with the prediction. But if we have these uh, universes bifurcating, how can we guarantee that, you know, you know, you would have one version of you saying, ah, that happens a lot. And another version of you saying, oh, well, that rarely happens. Because you would think that these bifurcations, these splittings would just happen equally. And, and there are ways, uh, it's a little bit technical, but there are ways using um, the idea of game theory mm. and the idea of betting to try to uh, say, okay, well, you know, we can't really know what, you know, what will happen when the person bifurcates and can't convince them, but maybe we can use the idea of betting to say, what would they predict happen? And then kind of give them a little bit of a reward mm. if they end up correct. And that game theory method uh, would guarantee that it would be more likely that they would get the, um, the outcome predicted by the Born rule. Mm. So there are ways using this idea of betting and probability 
uh, to to match up the Bourne rule with with what happens. Mm. Um, but uh, on a different scale, the universe itself, um, you have these uh, multiple universes, bubble universes, and it's a, just a very very different theory mm. uh, that um, you have all these worlds out there. And some have tried to combine the two. For example, physicist Brandon Carter uh, developed something called the Anthropic Principle, mm-hmm. which is trying to ascertain what happens in our universe based on, in one, in one of his theories, a medley of other universes out there, and that we're in the one universe where conditions were just right um, to produce uh, conscious life, but all the other universes' conditions were not right to create conscious and that's why we're in this universe and not in all those other universes. And that is a way of pinning down the constants of our universe, the parameters, to try to narrow them down. And Carter did make reference in his paper to the many worlds idea. So he saw some commonality in there. It's, it's very interesting how we're, we're always trying to figure out, because we haven't found yet i mean again it's it's still we haven't it's not like we can again like in science fiction just you know kind of travel to different worlds in a spaceship and find other life forms but (laughs) we're always sort of kind of building our model in a gap way of like well we do have life here and we have this goldilocks zone and we have all these things but you know it's not even plausible that that could happen in another galaxy and another universe as well that there's you know, a star that planets rotate around and it's a certain distance from it. And, you know, there's certain types of uh, chance or luck where just like on this planet where life forms, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it, it's plausible, right? I mean, that's not implausible. If, if, it, if it can happen here, it could happen in another, in another universe for sure, no? I mean, wouldn't that be plausible? Well, Brandon Carter, in formulating the anthropic principle, uh, looked at something very different called the Copernican principle. Mm. And the Copernican principle says that we're not special, mm. that earth, you know, is just an average planet going around an average star and an average part of the galaxy. And there are all these other uh, galaxies out there and they could very well have their own planets. And, and that's reasonable. But Brandon Carter said, Hey, wait a minute. We can't be absolutely average because uh, for example, um, our galaxy has regions where planets could not, you know, with life, could not very form, form very easily. There are uh, solar systems, or stellar systems, that cannot support planets. Their star is is not the right type, um, you know, support life. I mean, because their star is not the right type, maybe their planets are too close. So um, the sort of conscious life that we see on Earth might require certain conditions, certain special conditions. But then Carter went beyond that. So he talked about the weak anthropic principle, which says our, that we have a special place in our universe. And then the strong anthropic principle, which imagined a medley of universes. Mm. And some of, he, he didn't necessarily say that these are real. This could just be a thought experiment, imagining all the other universes out there and saying, well, some of them might expand so quickly that structure could not form. So you wouldn't have any stars, you wouldn't have any planets. The universe would just be kind of a failure from that aspect because you know gravity would not be strong enough in that universe to unite things. Everything would just blow apart. And on the other hand, you could have a universe which starts off with very strong gravitation, very massive, and just almost immediately collapses. And you wouldn't have time to form stars and galaxies and, and planets with life and so forth. So you have these extremes. And Carter was kind of saying, we're sort of a Goldilocks universe in that we expanded to just the right rate to form stars and planets and life as we know. Mm. That's, yeah, it's, just a, it's such an interesting, interesting way of trying to think about how always, always us meaning the planet in contrast with other systems, other galaxies, other universes. And 
I don't know. I don't know how special we are. Or we aren't, but uh, there, there, there's, you know, we, we do, we are, you know, here. And uh, it's interesting to think about that on the, on the big scale of things. Something that has more um, interest, I think, in some ways is this idea. So obviously people know Stephen Hawking and his work with, you know, black holes and Ben Horizon, all that stuff. Uh, Penrose as well. But um, there's this idea of, or not idea, but the, w- something that's been studied more and more and more is, is, is dark matter and dark energy. Um, how do we, what, what's our current understanding of, of both? You can talk about the differences between the two, but of both of these things. And again, why is it hard to study? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of problem. Uh, many people are trying to understand it, but it could be, many clues there to understanding a lot of the questions we have. So what's the, what's the current state of, of how we're trying to understand dark matter and, and dark energy? Yeah, well, I once went to a dark energy conference some years ago, and every talk was a variation of, we don't know what it is. <laughs> we don't know what it is. <laughs> but, so that was kind of interesting. But, but it's something, um, right? Like it's some, there's well, something. Well, we do. Yeah, well, so... We do know that uh, starting in 1998, that the universe is not only expanding, Mm -hmm. but it's speeding up in its expansion, Mm -hmm. which is really weird because if you throw a baseball into the air, like you expect it to land because it's not being propelled itself. You just throw it and then you let go of it and gravity is bringing it Mm -hmm. down to earth. If you could throw it, if you were Superman and throw it with enough strength, maybe you could get it into orbit Mm -hmm. and then, you know, it would stay in orbit. And then uh, you would imagine uh, throwing it even stronger and maybe it would go up, but maybe escape orbit, but it would still keep slowing down. It wouldn't speed Mm -hmm. up. And those were the three scenarios for the universe until 1998, um, that the universe would expand, but then recollapse. Uh, or expand forever, but keep slowing down, or be in the cusp of the two, expand forever, but almost, you know, keep slowing down and almost collapse, but not quite make it. Mm. So those were the three scenarios. And then in 1998, trying to test those scenarios, two teams of astrophysicists looked at uh, distant supernova or exploding stars and took some measurements and came up with the astonishing realization that no, um, the universe is not slowing down in its expansion. It's actually speeding up and gravity does not explain it. So you needed to add an extra ingredient, dark energy. And um, it was named by Michael Turner um, in reaction to something else that was mysterious at the time, this idea that galaxies have missing material to hold them together. And that's called dark matter. So dark matter is kind of a cosmic glue and uh, dark energy is a kind of cosmic anti-gravity that pushes things apart. Um, Mm. So they kind of act in opposite ways, but we don't know what either of them is. And um, one idea for dark energy is to model it using something that was discarded, introduced and then discarded by Einstein called the cosmological constant. Mm which is an anti-gravity term that's added to general relativity. And as it turns out, you can calculate the cosmological constant based upon the energy of the vacuum, of quantum particles coming in and out of the vacuum, and you can calculate their energy, and you get very, very different values for the cosmological constant needed to accelerate the universe versus the cosmological constant that would be uh, you know, calculated from the vacuum energy, and vastly different uh, quantities. So there are some theories involving the multiverse that said, well, maybe we're an outlier universe. Maybe we're this, this weird universe where mm-hmm. the cosmological constant is extremely small, just leading to you know, a very, very slow acceleration, very gradual acceleration. And that's just the right amount mm. to allow for star formation mm-hmm. and for 
the light that bloomed, but in all these other universes, the cosmological constant is super huge. And that means that the universe blows up really, really rapidly and there's no life and we're not there to talk about it. So um, that's a, a way to apply the multiverse to try to pin down the cosmological constant and, and pin down dark energy. I'm still trying to get my head around this anti-gravity kind of thing. How, 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 how does that live in space or how does that exist in space with gravity as well? Like how are they not like offsetting each other? Well, uh, gravity tends to weaken when things get far apart. From each other. Uh -huh. So gravity is not constant by any means. Mm. As the universe expands, galaxies move far and far apart from each other. And then um, the gravitation uh, weakens. So um, we, we see that by um, the fact that we're not experiencing a strong pull from Saturn or from Jupiter, mm. you're experiencing some pull, mm. but you know, it's the moon that's causing the tides, mm. you know, causing the oceans to rise and fall periodically. And it's the sun that causes the earth to travel in its orbit. And then the gravity of Saturn and Jupiter and Neptune and so forth um, tugs on the earth a little bit and maybe causes subtle wobbles in our you know, nothing major um, to talk about. And similarly, when, when galaxies move farther and farther apart, their gravitational effect on each other weakens. But uh, the dark energy does not weaken with distance. Mm. It's constant. Mm. So, um, so that means that as gravity weakens, this uh, subtle force that was once insignificant starts having a stronger and stronger effect. Mm. Um, so, um, you, know, you know, suddenly it's, it's like having, you know, this tiny propulsion system, like a tiny rocket on, on a baseball when you throw it and you, you throw it a little bit, um, the baseball would drop immediately down to the ground despite having this tiny propulsion system. Tiny, you know, battery, uh, you know, nine volt battery or something, and then if you um, threw it really, really up into space, suddenly, far from the gravity of Earth, um, you would have uh, this tiny propulsion system would take off, and you'd see it moving in a straight line due to this, you know, nine volt battery propulsion system. Similarly, dark energy really takes off when the galaxies are very far apart from each other. And then you, that's when you start noticing this effect of a pushing. Mm. Mm. It's very, very, very interesting how, how, how that, how that works and how we, we, gravity is such a big, big, uh, a big, big player in how, and how much of what, what earth is, what earth is doing and, or, or also not doing. So I want to give you time a little bit just to tell us about string theory. Uh, you mentioned it in the book, it's obviously, Popular, somewhat controversial in some ways, but um, what's the what's the kind of um, overview of this? I mean, it, it starts to get kind of complicated. You have hadrons and quarks and all, all of these different things. Um, and the the biggest thing with it is is that it could be uh, the best thing ever. It could explain everything, right? The unifying theory, but we just can't prove it. We can't obviously observe it. Um, you know, how how do we? It, <laughs> Is it worth considering even? Is it worth spending time on if, if, if we can't get there? Or is it just we need to do more work and then, you know, we might one day or, yeah, give us the overview and, and what do you think? Is it, is it helpful or, or I don't say harmful, but is it, is it, you know, is it worth considering, I guess? Well, string theory started as a theory of originally how quarks could, um, even before they talked about quarks, how a strong force, which is a force holding the nucleus together, could keep everything together. And, they, and there was one theory, well, maybe there are these energetic strands that keep everything together. But then later, once um, the modern idea of the strong force was developed with quarks and gluons, um, people applied string theory 
to a, a question of how do you uh, apply quantum theory to gravitation? Because uh, if, you, if you imagine everything as a particle and you say, tr you try to apply quantum theory to um, gravitation between the particles, you get these terms which are infinite and mathematically unviable and you can't get rid of them no matter how much you try to get rid of these infinite terms. So the theory doesn't work. But then if you switch the particles, the point particles, to tiny strands of energy that vibrate, then you get a viable um, theory, or at least a mathematically viable theory, not necessarily a physically viable theory. Um, that's far in the future. So mathematically, the question of changing particles into tiny strands seems to make sense because you get rid of infinite terms. But then uh, the question is, what do these strands vibrate in? Um, people try to make them vibrate in ordinary space. I got all these uh, contradictions mathematically. Uh, then they said, well, let's try to increase the number of dimensions. And they came up with uh, ideas of 10 and 11 dimensional space time that these strings live in. And we don't see um, the extra dimensions because, according to one theory, they collapse mm -hmm. and into kind of this tiny ball or tiny knot and literally left with four dimensions and that all the other dimensions are so tiny, so curled up in such a, a minute way that you can't really detect them, but they're still out there and they still allow for a string theory, but they're just indetectable. So that sounds fine, except for the fact that, first of all, we haven't, if we can't detect these dimensions, may, could there be indirect effects? Mm -hmm. And string theories, theorists are trying to ponder indirect effects on, on the number of dimensions. And also, the way that these dimensions fold up, the way that they collapse, turns out that there are an incredible number of ways that these higher dimensions can twist up or fold up into each other. And it turns out to be uh, 10 followed by 500 zeros, which is an incredible number. Right like unimaginable number of ways that these can twist up. And then, you know, each twisted universe where you have the dimensions twisting up gives other implications for particles. Mm. As it turns out, you have different particle worlds. And the question then is how to narrow these down. And one idea is to, to place string theory in something called a string fitness landscape in multiverse mm -hmm. where you have all these possible universes each with a different way that strings curl up and that only one of these produces um, the ideal universe that expands in, in a certain way and produces life as we know it mm -hmm. you know so that combines um, string theory possibly the bubble universe idea the anthropic principle all into this this idea of the string landscape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's every time I hear this, it's always hard to really kind of wrap my head around it. I mean, I get it, but it, it, I don't know. It just sounds so fantastical in some ways. In other ways, no. I mean, I think there's obviously, there's something going on, obviously, but I think I do like the idea of uh, can we measure indirect effects? I think that would be probably helpful or more helpful. Um, so I guess the one, one other thing here is uh, you mentioned David Deutsch in the book. He's, he's great. And he talks about the interesting thing that I, I thought was interesting about how space and time are an equal footing in his multiverse, right? And so you see there's this concept that he has in there that you, you mentioned about seeing time flow as an illusion. So what is, what is David up to? What's he on? What's he on about with this? What is what is what is this idea for us to understand about how he sees time and in, in all kind of time, space and time in, on this equal footing in, in the multiverse? Well, he he has a lot of theories. He's a brilliant scientist mm -hmm. and has a lot of ideas. But the one I kind of particularly address in my book is this idea of island universes mm -hmm. being each instant is 
time being its own universe and these being connected through causal interactions between them. And uh, it's the idea that time is discrete, um, which, which other people have talked about, but also the way of connecting these, these discrete moments of time um, that there may be other possibilities out there mm. and that just somehow physics, the laws of physics and our conscious choices uh, connect us from moment to moment and that um, the continuity of time is an illusion that rather it's you know hopping from one discrete island to another discrete mm. island, uh, which is which is very it is very interesting yeah he's 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 a he's a very interesting thinker, isn't he? He's he's, he's very kind of outside the box and in good ways. You need people like that. It's very interesting. So two final questions. Uh, I kind of mentioned this in the beginning. So you know, I, I, we've mentioned you mentioned uh, you know kind of the Marvel universe. You know, with with popular media, it's very popular. It's it's a way to um, make sure that characters never die. Uh, <laughs> keep coming back for more films. Uh, or shows I mentioned Interstellar, um, so on and so forth. Even even shows like on Netflix, um, the show Dark, which which played around with a lot of these ideas too. It was a very interesting show. It's a German show. Uh, all these different things in media, and then you've had you know books and you know things like that forever. Uh, do you do you find that stuff? I mean, I think in some ways it's good that people think about science and they think about you know physics as well, but. Um, a lot of those things just seem like science fiction, though, and they're not really accurate. Although some have tried to to kind of get the science right on some things. You know, I think Interstellar had Kip Thorne, and I think uh, The Martian had uh, somebody on there. They, they were they were trying to be a little bit better about it. Do you do you think that in general it's a win for science for people to think about these ideas and talk about it and read book, good books by scientists and 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 then they they go out and they buy the allure of the multiverse, you know, which is great for you and everything. And so, <laughs> you know, is it is it a, is it a win there or is it, um, you know, do you think it's also kind of you know a little bit, uh, you know, not good to get confusing about you know ideas and things like that? What what do you think about how we talk about it in popular media? Well, the popular version of the multiverse is a little bit of a blessing and a curse. Mm. It's a blessing because it gets people talking about it. And so if a scientist says, oh, I have this idea of detecting subtle scars of colliding universes in the Big Bang cosmic background radiation, um, then you know, this idea of the multiverse might uh, enable some, let's say, a wealthy donor or someone involved in the government to say, oh, wait a minute, multiverse. I know that from uh, <laughs> Doctor Spider Strange. Movies. Yeah, Doctor Strange was doing I know that. Right? Yeah, I know what that is. Yo, yeah, let's fund it. Um, but then, um, but then you have, might have other scientists. You know, might be kind of like, hey, wait a minute, why are you funding this? This is science fiction, and they might not look at the details of what particularly is being tested. So, what might be, you know, what's being tested might be very much within the realm standard astrophysics or standard quantum mechanics, you know, quantum mechanics experiments designed to test what happens when you take a measurement. And if you say we're trying to uh, test, you know, the multiverse, or whether or not there's, you know, many tests the many worlds interpretation, um, some scientists might immediately balk and say, come on, you know, that's, that's not real science. Mm. You know, let's stick to something you know more standard, like you know, scattering experiments or something. Mm. Not realizing that um, there may be aspects of the multiverse that, even though they're not directly detectable, might be indirectly detectable. They might be like a logical extension of something that is very standard, but it makes makes the science sound you know very weird. It sounds makes it sound science fiction. Mm. So, um, so that's why um, you know you find very very varied reactions to the idea of the multiverse. And I found that on social media, some people are like, "Wow, that sounds fascinating," and other people are like, "Hey, wait a minute, you know that's not science. Mm. Not even like considering the particular experiments or 
particular theory, mm. they immediately dismiss anything with that label as not science, mm. which I think is, is kind of unfair because labels are labels. And, you know, for example, when black holes were first proposed, you know, people who are unfamiliar with that label, uh, they thought it sound, sounded a bit like some people thought it sounded a bit like science fiction mm-hmm. and something just weird, like not standardized. Mm. And uh, same with things like quarks. Until people got used to that, it just sounded like science fiction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? So a lot of ideas sound science fiction from the start. Higher dimensions, mm-hmm. you know, the fourth dimension mm-hmm. uh, was considered in the 19th century either abstract math or the occult or <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and now and now it's considered standard so you never know when something that sounds science fictionly might eventually become mm-hmm. standard yeah there's that weird kind of um relationship between we get something in science fiction and it's it's science fiction we know it's it's not real and then you know maybe 15 20 years later scientists are like you know actually you know, there's an idea that's kind of similar to this and it's like well but the idea for the science fiction story came from some obscure science you know what I mean? it's just there's a kind of like loop almost that that kind of happens with that um yeah, quantum <clears throat> quantum teleportation is another mm. example it's you know it's considered very valid mm. uh, people engaged in that have won the Nobel prize mm. but you know but then it's not the same as the star trek idea of <laughs> right right so my my last question for you is, um, you know, kind of, you know, I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. I mean, in ten years, twenty years, fifty years, hundred years, as you as you look out, you know, what are we doing now? Uh, what are the what are the ideas, potential ideas and theories that are that are out there that you know are maybe a little bit fringe, maybe a little bit. So maybe the you know, teleportation is one of them. We we talked about dark energy, dark matters, a lot of things to mind there what are other things on our horizon if you will um that people are trying to say you know this this sounds a little wild but hear me out like what are some some ideas or theories about either the planets or the universe or multiple universes what are some kind of ideas that are getting um some attention or some people have been discussing well i I don't think it's very easy to predict the future Mm. in science and technology Mm. Found even in my lifetime, things that were predicted uh, haven't happened, like you know, the idea of moving sidewalks, <laughs> flying cars. Yeah, it hasn't happened yet. You don't see yeah, that. It hasn't happened. On the other hand, like I don't remember when I was a little kid, anyone saying there'll be these little computers mm-hmm. in people's pockets. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it's hard to predict in science, but you can look at gaps. And one thing that the James Webb Space Telescope is mm-hmm. telling us is that there. Are are big gaps in our understanding of galaxy formation mm. because we have you look back in time and you see galaxies that are similar to galaxies today and we say wait a minute our theory says that galaxies at that time would would be look very different mm. that these primordial galaxies mm-hmm. that are evolving and you know much simpler mm. so that needs to be revised There are all these areas um, where there are gaps in science that need to be understood. Combining quantum physics with gravitation has been a big question for many years. But the question is, will people be able to come up with a quantum, successful quantum theory of gravity? Um, so I, I, I'm optimistic that theorists of the future will be able to come up mm. with ideas for trying to resolve these big issues. Mm. As they did in the past, mm. but you know, this is a, an opening for if you're watching this and you're considering a career in science. There are many oh, yeah. uh, ideas in science mm-hmm. to explore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with that. And there's so many things, as I mentioned, you know, the the quantum realm, uh, dark energy and matter. Uh, I know some people, you know, get very excited about Mars, and some people love still talking about actual aliens and all of those things. But in terms of the science, though, there's there's so many things to to still know. And I, I agree with you about the James Webb uh, uh, instrument is 
is, I mean, the images are spectacular, but then it's, okay, what, what, what's the data you can pull from that and say, wow, we're, we were wrong about this or well, we need to amend or correct this or this could really reshape how we think about dying stars or how galaxies form or things like that. And that, that stuff is super exciting. That stuff's really, really exciting to, to see. So that's, that's much, much to uncover there. Uh, the book is called The Allure of the Multiverse, Extra Dimensions, Other Worlds, and Parallel Universes. Uh, out through wonderful basic books. Uh, and everyone can go and pick that up. Uh, Paul, this was too much fun. I could talk to you about this stuff yeah. for hours and hours. Uh, I'm, I'm jealous you get to do this for your, your day job. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I greatly appreciate you coming on the podcast and, uh, and, and talking about this. It's, uh, it's always a, a nice, uh, nice excuse to get someone on to talk about all these really, really cool things that uh, I don't get to think about on an everyday basis. So um, your book is fabulous. Uh, it's very accessible. And uh, I, I can't say enough thanks for, for coming on here and, and talking about it so clearly and, and wonderfully. So a big, big, big thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Xavier. My pleasure. Really Absolutely. Absolutely. Great.